with three very different uh, uh, perspectives, two from newly appointed professors and one from uh, a newly appointed member of our senior team, the University Executive Group, uh, uh, our new vice principal. So that's what you've got in front of you for the next hour or so. The session lasts an hour and 15 minutes. Each of our colleagues get 15 minutes. It says in my brief or so. So at 15 minutes, the hook will come out and you'll be pulled off the stage. Gets 15 minutes to uh, uh, give you a sense of what they're doing. And then once we've had the three presentations, colleagues will come up and join us here in the traditional panel. And it'll be the opportunity for those in the room and those online to uh, ask any questions. And hopefully we'll get a bit of a conversation going. Uh, and then we'll stop in an hour and 15 minutes for another cup of coffee. And then the next session will begin after that. But first of all, let's enjoy ourselves. Uh, please join me in welcoming the first of our speakers, uh, Dr. David Macbeth, who's going to be talking about university as a driver for economic transformation. David. Thank you. Well, thanks very much and uh, welcome uh, to those of you that weren't already here for the for the court session. Um, as Ian says, um, I'm going to talk about the the, the kind of uh, portfolio that I have as a vice principal in the university, enterprise and economic transformation, and I'll try and give you a bit of a sense of the lens that I look through when I when I when I look at that portfolio. So this slide, although it says what are we trying to achieve, I'm real. It's a kind of mixture of what and why. Um, it's not just what. Um, I think we're a big employer in a city which is quite a, a, a mixed city in terms of its current economic status. You know, there's poor areas in Dundee, uh, a lot of deprivation. Um, there are also better off areas. Um, there are people in useful employment, but there are a lot of people who are unemployed or who are underemployed. And the university is such a big uh, actor in the city. Does I have, I feel, a duty uh, to try to have a positive impact on our city? And although we've talked about economic transformation, I'm seeing that as economic health, well-being, um, social purpose, and that plays onto the the right-hand side of the of the 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 the, the diagram there. Because as well as doing things that are positively beneficial to the city of Dundee and its citizens, uh, the second goal, I think, of the enterprise and economic transformation strategy, if you like, is to gain a reputation beyond Dundee for being good at this kind of stuff. And that is really important in a number of in a number of contexts. It's particularly important in terms of convincing government and policymakers that this is a sensible place to invest in. <coughs> But it's also important in terms of setting up a university that's seen as entrepreneurial. That will attract certain types of staff, it will attract certain types of students, and it will provide some competitive edge to the University of Dundee in the longer term. So it's got to, it's got that kind of immediate impact in the city and longer term reputational impact for the university wrapped up in the portfolio. There's three ways in which I'm proposing that we're going to achieve these things. The first one is institutional headline initiatives. These are typically a big splash in some respects. They're typically a, a significant capital project. Um, they're, they're big enough to be measured against their own business plans, which must pass muster with the university executive group and with university court if required. But all of these should play, must play into the goals of the schools and the university for its core activity. So if they don't benefit research or teaching or engagement, then we shouldn't be doing them. So they have to be, uh, they have to meet that criterion. Um, what I would say as well is they won't always involve every school. So, you know, some of them may be single school based initiatives. Some of them may be multiple school based initiatives. They do need to uh, enhance the academic uh, endeavour as well as having an impact on economic matters. Likewise, there will be school-led engagement activities. We're not starting from ground zero with this strategy. There's lots and lots of good things going on at the moment. What I want us to do is for the university corporately to adopt one or two or maybe three of those initiatives that are already going on and give them a bit of power, give them a bit more university wide endorsement that helps them to deliver, you know, the left hand side of that first slide that I put up helps them to deliver an impact in the city. And then the third part, which is kind of my historic bedrock, is professional services enabled enterprise activities. So that's 
specifically assisting staff, students, alumni, friends to form and grow companies here that will employ people here and hopefully that will have a very positive direct impact on the city, but they will be separate entities. We help them to form research and innovation services, the University Centre for Entrepreneurship, help things to form, help them to raise money and let them get out there and contribute to the economy of our city. Um, I'm starting with the headline initiatives and I'm kind of starting in the top left and going clockwise. Um, the Life Sciences Innovation District is probably the most ambitious of the initiatives in which we are taking a leading position. Um, and that's uh, the picture that you see there is the Technopole site, which is across Hawk Hill Road from um, the Life Sciences Building. Um, our partners in the Life Sciences Innovation District proposition uh, are uh, Dundee City Council. I don't know if anyone from the council is in the room. I hope someone will at least be, uh, be on, the, uh, on Teams. Um, and also Scottish Enterprise are a partner in this. Um, the ambition here is to create a thriving, uh, uh, a thriving research and development intensive local economy for biomedical, life sciences and health type companies. Um, and the goal is to have uh, many high hundreds slash thousands of uh, employees uh, in uh, those types of companies in kind of 10 to 15 years type time. And that's the vision that, that has been bought into uh, by those other partners, Dundee City Council and Scottish Enterprise. I think the other thing to say about that is it's not all PhDs. If these companies are, you know, are successful, there's opportunities for employment at all levels, technician level, support staff level, and hopefully a direct pass on to a better prospects for people who are born and brought up here in our, in our city. Um, and using the pointer, this here is the same thing as this. This is the innovation hub. Um, this building is currently coming out the ground on the Technopole site. Uh, if you've been over there, you'll see it. Um, this is funded by uh, the Tay Cities deal, um, which some of you may have heard of. It's existed for a few years now. UK and Scottish governments um, have uh, committed to a programme of total value of 700 million in the region. Um, and the intention is to do all sorts of different projects that will have a make, uh, that will have a huge impact on uh, the the, the uh, economic prosperity of the Tay Cities region. This is just one of those projects. The Tay Cities deal is putting 20 million approximately into that building, and the other 20 is a mixture of a significant commitment from the university itself, which is very uh, much appreciated and shows how committed the university is to this kind of stuff strategically. Um, and also from another public sector agency that I can't quite name at the moment, but you can probably make an educated guess. Uh, the Innovation Hub will open at the end of 2024 and um, it will have uh, it will have um, a number of tenant companies from day one that are in the airway growth stage of, of their uh, of their uh, journey, uh, and we hope to retain those companies for the benefit, you know, for the benefit of, uh, of of the economy here. And there's lots of people who deserve tons of credit for the the work that's been done in getting to this stage. I won't take time to give the name checks because I've got one eye on the clock and I'm already slowing down. Um, the third uh, the third one here is the Just Tech project. That's the university's other project uh, under the Tay Cities deal. This is about. Uh, piloting and uh, new technologies for uh, just for the justice system and it's based on the excellent reputation of the Weaverhume Centre for Research and Forensic Science which the university already has and um, it again has got an economic impact we very much hope that companies who are who have technologies that can be used in the justice system can can come and locate to, to this hub and it should be opening uh, what should be getting built in 25 26 and then the final one of these um, is the Eden project a lot of people will have heard of the Eden project for Dundee the proposal that there will be a significant development that oh, I've gone two slides on my apologies um, that this is the kind of current gas works down by the harbour and the proposal is that the Eden project will be a 100 30 million pound development there um, again opening kind of like 26 27 if things go according to plan um, all of these things ha are in scope for what for what I've been talking about because they have the potential to be 
synergistic with the things that your university wants to do anyway. They help us to demonstrate impact from our teaching. They help us to demonstrate impact from our research. Um, and they also have a positive impact on the fabric of the city. And that's why these headline initiatives are so important. Um, this is intended to be a generic member of university staff. It could be an academic, it could be a member of professional services asking, well, is this relevant to me? And I think that leads on to the to the school based initiatives, which I mentioned as the kind of middle pillar of the of the things that I was talking about. And th this is just intended to illustrate the point that I already made, really, which is that there are already a lot of things going on that have the potential to be very beneficial within the city and for the city's citizens. And that there might be one or more of these that we can grab a hold of and really turbocharge and put our weight behind. So the drug death crisis, that's actually a student led initiative, that, that, that student action that has created that. And some of you may already have had some exposure to that project. Um, the urban relief project under green planning, that's that's very much a kind of citizen science, citizen action project. It's 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 led out of the Duncan and Jordanson uh, College of Art and Design. Um, it's been funded by the European uh, by European funding historically, but it's got a life of its own and it will continue beyond that funding and again has an impact on the environment that we have here in the city. The law clinic and other clinics and I got another really good example where the citizens of the city receive benefit from our students um, and, 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 and our students gain benefit from being involved in practical casework. Um, and finally, the Help to Grow programme, which is run out of the School of Business. Um, this is a training course effectively for people who have started businesses. They don't need to be technology businesses. They don't need to be research based businesses. They just need to be small businesses and the business leaders get structured training free at the point of uh, free at the point of use um, to help them understand how to grow their businesses. These are just examples, but, but the purpose of them is to illustrate that one or two of these things or things like them, we need to adopt them and really give them the absolute maximum fuel we can to make them have that impact on the city, which we can then use as a kind of beacon for other people to do the same sort of thing. And moving on to the final part about the, the company creation stuff, the principles already touched on that um, and I've already touched on it. Creating companies is vitally important, I think, to a city like Dundee and it's it's important uh, for the university as well, but, but, it, but it's most important for the city because the idea of forming new companies that can grow is, is vital in, in regenerating cities that have perhaps got to the point that Dundee has, has got to where, you know, there isn't as much employment here as there should be, but there is a wealth of talent and a wealth of creativity, uh, not just amongst the staff and students of the university, but amongst the people of the, the, the city. So as, as as Ian mentioned, you know, we've, we've been rated number one for, uh, for spin out companies in, in the last year by Octopus Ventures, but over the preceding two or three years, there's been fourths, fifths and sixths. These are completely independent ratings and these are in the UK. That's first in the UK and fourth, fifth and sixth in the UK. It's not usually first in Scotland. So, that, so we've been externally recognised without having to ask for that recognition because we are doing a really good job in that respect. And I think it proves that with the right stuff and the right people and the right support, you know, there's a really good chance for Dundee to, 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 to build a decent economy round about this. And uh, these are some highlights of the, the university's kind of current portfolio of companies that have been formed. Um, almost all of these are in the kind of biomedical, uh, health, life sciences type area. But I don't want to pretend that those are the only types of companies that we form. And in fact, um, some people here may be familiar with the company Star Dundee that was formed probably about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I'm acutely familiar with it because one of my colleagues from Research and Innovation Services was poached by them uh, in 2023, but it gives, an imp it gives a good view that the company is making good progress. Um, but, but, but these are the, some examples of these companies. Most universities in Scotland would be uh, jealous of us for, for, for the companies that we have in our portfolio um, and it, particularly jealous of the two that I'm going to touch on right at the end here, Excientia, 
which I think a lot of you have, have probably already heard of. Artificial intelligence uh, enabled drug design um, founded here in uh, in 2012, I think, uh, by Professor Andrew Hopkins, who's still the chief executive of the company. And uh, it's already got 450 employees. And as you see there somewhere, uh, biggest European biotech IPO in uh, 2021 and, uh, you know, has it at points and it's uh, at points and it's uh, gestation has uh, uh, has been valued at over two billion US dollars. Amphista on a similar path, um, much more about a particular therapeutic class based very much on the on the technologies and uh, research of Professor uh, Alessio Chuli in, in the School of Life Sciences. Fantastic uh, credit to these companies for, for the journey they've been on, but I think to kind of wrap around to, to, to kind of conclude what I'm saying. Both of these companies are now headquartered in England and the majority of the staff of Exientia are in England. All of the staff of Amphista are in England. So that's not giving the universe, that's not giving the city of Dundee the economic benefit that we would like to give it. And that's that's really the, the key reason for the, the, the proposition of the Life Sciences Innovation District and the, and the Innovation Hub, which is to to, to anchor these companies nearest to where they're formed, nearer to the talent that created them in the first place and deliver that economic benefit into the city. So that, that that's the flavour from me. I know I've got a, a couple of minutes left. That That's the kind of lens that I, I see things through. Um, it's it's not all these things will come off. I think that's the other thing I would say. And, and I think everybody understands that. Not everything that's on that shopping list is going to be in the bag at the end of the visit. You know? But 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 if, if some of these things come off, as I believe they will, and if they come off to the to the level that they that, that, that they have the potential to, these are things that will have a big impact on the, the city of Dundee, they'll have a big impact on the Tay Cities region, and they'll have been driven out of this university and by talented individuals who are here at the moment, whether that's as staff or students or whatever. So that's the general flavour for me, and I'm going to stop at that point. Well, thanks, David. Um, uh, by the way, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm always wrong. They're all going to work. The shopping bag is going to be full and uh, uh, there'll be additional things as well. Uh, well, you know, folks, uh, uh, David called it out. And what I didn't say earlier is amongst that long list of people, and it is quite a long list of people that we need to pay uh, grateful thanks to for, uh, and I can see Morag Martins there and uh, uh, Mike Ferguson was here. There was a whole, whole range of people who have been incredibly influential in helping us get to uh, that life science innovation hub coming out the ground. But one of the people who's done most of that is indeed David himself, because uh, although David is is a newly appointed VP, he's been with us for, what, four years now? Three years now, three and a bit. Well, you're here before me and I've been here three years. So uh, uh, he was uh, a director of research and uh, innovation beforehand. And David's been really influential in helping us take um, uh, financial gain out of Exciencia, delivering on um, uh, the innovation hub uh, and the deals there, and also in ensuring that we, we got to that Octopus Ventures number one for spin out. So thank you, David, and I'm sure there's a, there's a lot more to come. Now we're going to shift gear a little bit, but not that far really, given that so much of what David's been talking about is about life sciences. What we're going to shift to now is Liz, Liz Miller. Liz is a newly appointed professor. You've been here, what, six months now, Liz, or so, so forth. Liz came to us from the very, very prestigious uh, Laboratory of Molecular Biology, the MRC, uh, LMB in um, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge, Oz, I think, is it Cambridge or Oxford? And given that I spent time in Cambridge at a biotech company, it has to be Cambridge. By the way, David, I was uh, at the Cambridge Science Park when it, when it, when it was about the size of the Technopole. Uh, at one of the two biotech companies at times a long time ago, I admit, but look what they can do and anything they can do, Dundee can do better. Liz is the, uh, uh, an, an outstanding uh, uh, biologist. She's, her focus is on, on membrane biology and she's going to give us a little bit of science and a little bit of data. And uh, I said, well, 
enough data, Liz, but you promised to be gentle to the audience. Liz, <laughs> over to you for some biology. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Ian, and thanks to you all for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to get a chance to present our research to you, um, and I hope I can bring you all along the way. Um, so our bodies are made up of lots of different individual cells. On the order of 30 trillion cell individual cells, a compartmentalized different function of all of the different things that our bodies have to do. So our brain cells will communicate and organize thoughts and, and coordinate all of the processes by working together. Um, our liver cells will process the alcohol we had for dinner last night by working together. Muscle cells will do work for, for all of us. Um, and so, so the, the basic building block of all of our bodies is cells. But within cells, it's actually proteins that do the work. And we can think of proteins as protein machines that are created from the genetic blueprint in the DNA that we have. And that DNA is then decoded into protein machines that are actually what do the work of different cells. And so this beautiful cartoon or, or watercolor painting actually by a wonderful artist, David Goodzell, depicts the interaction between two neuronal cells. So this is one neuronal cell on the bottom, and this is its border, its cell membrane. And this is a second neuronal cell on the top with its border, its cell membrane. And this cell is in the process of releasing chemicals, neurotransmitters, that will be perceived by protein blobs on the surface of the communicating cell. And that signal will be understood by that cell and the signal will be transmitted to, to have an output within this second cell, all through the work of individual proteins. So it's protein machines that do the work that actually make cells do what they need to do in our bodies. And what my lab is interested in understanding is how those protein machines get made and how those protein machines get delivered to the right spot in each cell so that they can do the work that they need to do in the right place and at the right time. And so specifically what we look at are about the 10,000 proteins, 10,000 different types of proteins. Again, this, this corresponds to about a third of your genome. So about a third of your genome in codes for protein machines that will be secreted from the cell, that leave the cell and travel through the body to do different types of functions and communicate with different other types of cells. And so we have about 10,000 proteins that are secreted sent outside the cell. And I'm gonna wander around a little bit so I can point a little bit better. These kinds of secreted proteins do all sorts of things. So, so certain types of, of white blood cells are dedicated to secreting antibodies that fight infection. Your intestinal cells will secrete enzymes that help digest the lunch that we just ate. Um, your, uh, your tissues, hair and skin and, and um, connective tissues are made up by secreted molecules called collagen and keratins that form the structure that holds all of our tissues together. And um, very important in, in diseases like heart disease are the, the cholesterol molecules that are secreted by cells um, that travel through the body and can do harm and actually good things as well. And so it's, it's this process, these 10,000 types of different proteins that get sent outside of an individual cell that is the focus of what my lab studies. Um, whoops. Okay, and so just like our body is compartmentalized into different cell types, our cells are compartmentalized into different structures called organelles. And again, that serves to compartmentalize different functions so that different parts of the cell can do exactly what they need to do. So this is zooming in on a, a type of blood cell called a plasma cell using an electron microscope to really visualize internal structures within this cell. This big blob in the middle is the nucleus. This houses the genetic material that is the blueprint for life and for each of us as individuals. These small little blobs are mitochondria. Mitochondria make the energy, the ATP, that powers all of the work that our bodies need to do. And these sheets of structures are called the endoplasmic reticulum. And this, of course, is the best organelle in the cell because this is the organelle that makes all of those 10,000 secreted proteins that need to get delivered outside of the cell. And this is the focus of what my lab studies. So, so again, these are these sheets of, of membrane enclosed um, structures is the endoplasmic reticulum. And this again is a beautiful illustration by David Goodsell that shows sort of the protein blobs that are associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, which is here de delineated in green. This is this pink blob is a ribosome. This is the protein machine that makes other proteins. And so this ribosome sits on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum and through another protein channel 
pumps newly synthesized protein as it's being made into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. And so in fact, this particular cartoon is showing the biogenesis of antibody molecules shown here as this sort of beige blob. And what will happen is that these, these newly synthesized proteins will fold into the correct three-dimensional structure within the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then those proteins get captured into vesicles that bud off from the endoplasmic reticulum. And that's what's happening here. Through another set of cytoplasmic proteins, that bend the membrane and bend that structure and populate the right proteins into that structure. And it's this process that I wanna tell you about today of how a cell makes a, a vesicle carrier and populates it with the right kinds of proteins and how we can manipulate that process, hopefully for therapeutic benefit. Okay, so this to come back to this sort of cartoon idea, there's lots of these different kinds of secretory proteins that need to be delivered to different destinations and secreted outside the cell. They start their life in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then they all transit from the endoplasmic reticulum through a set of intermediate carriers that are called COP2 vesicles. And these vesicles are little membrane bubbles that bud from the endoplasmic reticulum, and then will fuse with the next compartment in the cell that's responsible for doing a lot of sorting, and this is called the Golgi apparatus. This process of, of capture into these COP2 vesicles is what we're interested in in my lab. And we know a lot about the, this process. We know that there are specific proteins, in fact, called COP2. This is what the, the, the name stands for, coat protoma type 2. So these are proteins that coat the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum and make these membrane bubbles that bud off and, uh, and with them carry the, the newly synthesized proteins that need to ultimately be delivered outside the cell. OK, but so how do proteins get into these bubbles? and how, what can we understand about that process and how can we maybe manipulate that process to change the, the, the secretion landscape of different cell types? And I can tell you about why that um, might be useful in a minute or two. Okay, so as I said that protein machines do all of the work in cells and this, this process is, is very much the same. What's doing the work here and making sure that the right proteins get captured into these vesicles or bubbles is all driven by a series of protein-protein interactions. So this is a cartoon model of a protein called SEC24, which is one of these COP2 coat proteins that coats the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum to make these bubbles. SEC24 will decode sorting signals that are found on cargo proteins that get captured into these vesicles. And so SEC24 will interact directly with another protein called SERF4 that forms a bridge across the lipid bilayer or the membrane that separates one side of, of the endoplasmic reticulum from the other. And SERF4 in turn will interact with this with uh, its own kind of cargo protein. So, so these protein-protein interactions are the key part of getting a newly synthesized protein like PCSK9 into these COP2 vesicles. And by understanding these molecular details of these interactions, we hope to be able to then manipulate how different kinds of cargo molecules can get into these vesicles. And so I'm gonna tell you about this, this protein as an example, PCSK9, because it's one of the first ones that we're really interested in and, and we're interested in it for good reason. So PCSK9 is a regulator of cholesterol homeostasis in our cells. So there are human beings walking around who are mutants for PCSK9. They don't have any PCSK9. And the effect of that is that they are hypocholesterolemic. So they're actually healthier than most of us because they have less circulating cholesterol. So they have less heart disease. They're less prone to all of these problems that are associated with high cholesterol. So PCSK9 and working out how to inhibit PCSK9 is a really attractive drug therapy for people who may be resistant to statins and other kinds of treatments. At the moment in the clinic, there are um, antibody therapies that target PCSK9, but these are antibody therapies. They're very expensive. They have to be taken intravenously as injections. And so it's not like taking a pill to lower your cholesterol very easily. But if we had a small molecule that could inhibit PCSK9, then that, that would be really great. And so what we're working on is not actually a drug to inhibit PCSK9, but a drug to inhibit the secretion of PCSK9. And so just to sort of walk you through a little bit of what PCSK9 does is um, cholesterol, circulating cholesterol, LDL, is taken up into cells through a cell surface receptor called the LDL receptor. And what usually happens if PCSK9 is also in the bloodstream is that entire package gets internalized into the cell and delivered to the lysosome where it's all degraded, including the receptor. If, 
patients or people don't have PCSK9 or PCSK9 is inactive, what happens is the LDL receptor lets go of the LDL to get degraded, but it itself traffics back to the cell surface for another round of scavenging more LDL. And that's why PCSK9 mutant humans um, have lower circulating cholesterol because they have more of this scavenging material on the cell surface and they, they take up more LDL from, from the bloodstream. And so what our idea then is that if we can understand these molecular interactions, how is it that PCSK9 gets captured into these vesicles at the very outset, and we can block those interactions with small molecule inhibitors, then we pre can prevent secretion of PCSK9 and lead to this situation where patients will, or, or um, people treated with these molecules will have lower circulating cholesterol because of they have extra LDL receptor on their cell surface. OK, so we set out to, 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 to try and do this to first just map the interactions, to sort of map these protein-protein binding events that lead to PCSK9 interaction. And so we generated a system which makes use of a firefly luciferase. So this is a protein in fireflies that makes them glow in the dark. Um, and so what we, what we can do is to take this luciferase protein and split it into two parts. So it's broken and it doesn't work, it doesn't emit light and you fuse the two parts of those proteins to the two proteins that we're interested in. In this case, SEC24, which is one of these coat proteins that makes vesicles, and SERF4, which is the receptor that binds to PCSK9. And when these two proteins bind together, that reconstitutes luciferase, and we can see a light signal that's, that's emitted. So when we get a protein-protein interaction, we have a readout of light. And so that's, this is the data that I'm showing you here, where if we have an interaction with SEC24, and SURF4, this is the wild type situation, we have a nice big luminescent signal and that's what we're reading out here. And then what we can do is to go in and make point mutations to so to make ge genetic alterations that change the structure of SEC24 to block specific sites around the surface of SEC24 that we thought might be involved in this interaction with SURF4. And this is what I'm showing you here. This is a, a mutant called the B-site mutant. And when we mutate this surface pocket of SEC24, what we see is a decrease in this luminescent signal. So there's less light being emitted because there's less interaction between these two proteins. So this, this identification of the B site on SEC24 as the um, site of interaction for SURF4 is really exciting to us because there was a known small molecule that is, was known to block and bind that B site. And so if you think of the, the surface of SEC24 as sort of bumpy and there's a little hollow here that SURF4 will bind in, this small molecule plugs up that site and will prevent SURF4 from binding. And so we asked then if this sm small molecule for PBA, in fact, in our assay in a cell, did actually prevent this interaction between these two proteins and reduce the luminescent signal from luciferase. And of course, I wouldn't be telling you this if it didn't. Um, and so if we add increasing amounts of 4-PBA to our luciferase-based signal, where we see this light emitted when we have this interaction, if we add in more and more 4-PBA, we sequentially see less and less of this interaction, suggesting in fact that 4-PBA really is perturbing this interaction between these two proteins. So then of course, this is the million dollar question is, does this small molecule then inhibit the secretion of PCSK9, which is what we really care about. We don't necessarily care about the interaction between SEC24 and SURF4. And so we wanted to then ask whether PCSK9 secretion can be inhibited by blocking this interaction and by treating cells with 4-PBA. And so to do that, we used an experimental method called a pulse chase analysis. So just to walk you through very quickly what this experiment does is we take a cell and we feed that cell radioactive amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And if you use radioactive amino acids to feed to cells, they'll incorporate that radioactivity into any protein that's being synthesized at that point in time. That's the pulse labeling. So it's labeling with radioactivity under a short pulse condition. And so we pulse label cells by feeding them radioactivity. So then PCSK9 that's made during that pulse labeling event will be radioactive. And then we chase over time to give the cell time to secrete that protein into, and release it into the cell media. And so that's the chase part of the experiment. And then be, we, can, we can isolate these specific proteins and because radioactive is highly quantifiable, we can quantify the amount of radioactivity that's associated with the protein that made it into the media 
relative to the amount that was found in, in when you just bust open the cell, the total protein that was synthesized in that pulse labeling experiment. And so then what we want to do is to do this pulse chase experiment plus and minus our small molecule and understand how PCSK9 secretion to the media is impacted by treatment with this drug. And so again, here we see over time, over increasing chase time, this is the secretion of PCSK9, radioactive PCSK9 secreted into the media. Over time, this increases nicely. So we get about 15% of what was made initially secreted within 80 minutes. And this blue line here is the amount uh, that's secreted after or during treatment with 4PBA. So this really tells us that there's a massive reduction in the secretion of PCSK9 when we block that interaction between SEC24 and SERF4. So so this is really hopeful to us that we can design and develop small molecules that block specific protein-protein interactions and have the effect then of reducing secretion of specific proteins. And now I'm sort of just, just to sort of highlight that this is not just specific for one particular set of molecules. I want to highlight that SEC24, the SEC24 protein, we all have four different versions of SEC4 encoded, SEC24 encoded in our genomes. And each SEC24 molecule has multiple different surfaces that interact with different proteins. And so one could imagine if we had a small molecule that blocked one of these sites specifically, then we could affect secretion of antibodies. If we had a different small molecule, we could impact secretion of collagen. And so there are lots of diseases that might be associated or might be um, impacted by selectively being able to inhibit branches of the secretory pathway, but leave the rest of secretion intact. Because of course, you don't want to inhibit secretion of gut enzymes and neurotransmitters and all of these other important things. And so this is so this is the goal of my lab now uh, at Dundee is to work collaboratively with really fantastic colleagues at the drug discovery unit to take these to identify small molecules, take small molecules that we know and make them even better as inhibitors. We're working with the human pluripotent stem cell facility to make these mutants in lots of different types of cell backgrounds so we can really understand in different cell types that have different jobs how their secreted proteomes change in these different conditions so that we can then target specific different kinds of, of um, diseases that, that might work. Um, of course, we're using proteomics as a, as a readout for a lot of these experiments, and we also have really fantastic collaborators that bring expertise in immunology that we don't necessarily have ourselves. Um, and so we're sort of super excited for the work that we're going to be doing here at Dundee. Um, we're funded very um, graciously by the Wellcome Trust, which is given, which is awarded as a discovery award, which affords eight years of funding um, to really have a long-term view on how this how this um, is is going to pan out. And so we have three fantastic new postdocs in the Dundee group, at Dundee group, and um, supported by uh, the the remnants of the Cambridge group. And so with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Liz, and gosh, gosh, that was a canter. That was a canter, and uh, uh, we'll check with some of the ex-biologists later how much they kept up with you. But uh, uh, it's it's incredible the uh, you know the connectivity and the story and narrative that you built there, and, and particularly if we can start to develop a number of small molecules. Of course, small molecules. Now, the beauty about small molecules is small molecules are relatively easy to synthesize into medicines, stable medicines that uh, 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 people can take. So small molecules is is the the target for uh, uh, therapeutic drugs for the future. And my goodness me, you've got a whole host of, of potential diseases and, and, and quite focused on different cell types as well. So you can have really quite targeted uh, therapies for individuals and uh, uh, also therapies that should be better tolerated than some of the um, uh, uh, rather um, sledgehammer type drugs that we see today. So really, really exciting stuff, really exciting. So we'll go from uh, exciting uh, 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 molecular um, uh, membrane biology, not just membrane biology, because so much of that was inside uh, the cell as well, to equally exciting, but maybe at a slightly mic uh, more micro scale, uh, energy uh, economics. And uh, Sean Moo, Sean has been, uh, uh, you, you've been here in Dundee for a little while, Sean. 15 years, yeah, it's not, not, not such a little while, but of course, yeah, you got the badge, yeah. But uh, uh, a newly promoted uh, professor, congratulations, in uh, uh, Centre for uh, Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy, 
part of the School for Humanities, Social Sciences uh, and Law. And Sean's, uh, well, amongst other things, that you, you, the, the definitive textbook on the economics of uh, uh, oil and gas. So um, uh, that alone deserves I'm not worthy, Sean. Uh, but Sean's been looking at um, the, 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 the rise of wind power and the economics of the impact of, of wind power on energy prices. So, Sean, looking forward to this very much indeed. Please join me in welcome to the Thank you, yeah, uh, for this uh, very kind introductory, and uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, so, uh, last time I was lecturing here was three years ago uh, in autumn 2021 during the pandemic where we are required to uh, keep the social distance. It's good to be back in this lecture theater. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about this is what blows with the wind. Obviously, uh, I'm an energy economist. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what's the result of the wind uh, when the wind blows to our energy uh, price. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, here in this 15 minutes, I plan to uh, speak a little bit about some of the basic uh, basic facts about wind energy uh, in the UK. And then uh, we'll, uh, I will share some of the latest research I have been doing with uh, some of my PhD students uh, on how has the growth in wind energy uh, impacted on electricity price and emissions. Uh, so because obviously everybody knows uh, the wind will play an important a role in the transition to net zero. And so this is uh, something that we have been doing for looking at empirically how has the wind ex expansion uh, impacted on our electricity bills and the emissions. Uh, a little bit unfortunate, so I'm looking at this empirical data, empirical evidence. The data is a little bit old, a few years old, uh, but not too old, okay. not, 20, uh, not up to 2024. And so uh, here are some a little bit uh, some of these uh, basics uh, facts uh, to state the obvious or almost the state of the obvious. Uh, the wind energy is cheap to generate because when it generates, as long as the wind blows, it can generate. It does not require uh, to burn fuels, so there are no almost no uh, operational costs, no fuel cost. Uh, but it, it is expensive to build. The construction cost of wind uh, on a per kilowatt hour basis is almost three times of that of the uh, gas fired uh, CCGT units, combined cycle gas turbines. Uh, so it's more expensive. And that's why uh, in the recent uh, in the last half a year also, if you pay attention to the headline news, uh, so in the UK, uh, we use the auctions to auction some of this uh, wind, offshore wind, and then the latest round, uh, the latest round was initially in, this was in yeah, September, so the Financial Times says, you know, there were uh, nobody come up for this offshore wind because the government said a limit that is, is low. And then uh, later on in November, the city of the same Financial Times says, you know, because the government has increased the cap for the wind energy. Uh, so it increased by 66% to 73 pounds per megawatt hour. So uh, that's the one fact. It is important for the electricity price because that's the you know the fact that it's uh, it's, uh, it's cheaper to generate. Uh, the second point is the obviously it is uh, zero emission uh, when it, at the point of generation, uh, but not so far. Uh, so uh, if you look at it from the life cycle perspective, is you know uh, when you build the uh, or manufacture wind blades, it does emit some CO2 emissions, but it's very low. Uh, the life cycle is very low. And finally, obviously, it depends on the weather. If the wind does not blow, you cannot generate. Uh, so uh, that's uh, what we call it's intermittent effect. Uh, so uh, that means 
even if in the future, if we have a large amount of wind in the electricity system, you always need something to back them up, and also you need some other resources to uh, back them. Uh, so that's why we look at this, uh, the issue, uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at what is, how does this expansion of wind energy over past 10 years or 15 years uh, has impacted on our intraday wholesale prices as well. Two, we will look at the CO2 emissions. Three, we will look at the system costs. So it's not just a look at the wholesale price. Uh, so uh, this slide shows the installed wind energy capacity over this is almost uh, uh, 20 years, 15 years. Uh, so it grows very fast. Uh, particularly starting from mid 2000. Uh, so in the I look at uh, about the last 15 years from 20 to the six seven. Uh, so it's uh, almost grew by 15 times. Uh, so from a little less than two. Uh, this is the megawatt to gigawatt uh, to uh, a little under. 30 gigawatt, so it's almost grew by uh, 15 times. Uh, now, obviously, wind. The the one bad thing about wind is uh, is you know is uh, uh, not uh, so all the wind capacity can generate all the time. It only generates when the wind blows, and all, so the onshore wind typically is the uh, utilization rate is about 25 percent. The offshore has a much higher, is about 40 percent. Uh, so that's uh, the wind, uh, the uh, on the gen how this will translate to generation. Now, this is the overall uh, electricity generation mix uh, from again from 20, 1996 to 2022. So this blue area uh, or green is the wind uh, is including both onshore and offshore wind. It has increased quite a lot uh, from say before 2005. It's almost negligible, and now it's almost a quarter, 25% of the wind, of the total wind we get. Uh, the expense is almost, the expense is the wind, the coal. The coal has almost zeroed out. Uh, so uh, that's all a right of reasons I will come back to. Now, uh, what, uh, so what we specifically look at this in this research is, uh, you know, uh, we look at how this will impact on the electricity price and uh, uh, so on the left this is the left hand side this picture this is the total load the load you know the electricity industry is uh, where all the industry you know the demand is called load right? so uh, basically is the total demand the demand uh, between 2009 and 2018 has been reduced uh, so you can re see reduced quite a bit, uh, a variety of reasons because so our energy system it becomes more efficient, the use of energy it becomes more efficient. Also, the industry becomes lighter. Uh, so you know, many of industries, manufacturing industries, uh, become uh, smaller, and uh, so the total demand has reduced, but the electricity price has actually has not reduced at least, right? has increased. So uh, one question I try to answer here is uh, what other factors contribute to this price change, right? Uh, I will skip that, that one. Uh, so uh, this is the, just the look at one uh, average uh, or a day uh, the UK electricity system used a half hour settlement period, there are 48 hours in a day. Uh, so uh, this is the total load and the total wind generation, the wind generation over the, uh, of course, the, uh, the 48 settlement periods, of course, 48 half hours or a day. So uh, you can see the good thing for UK, the wind in the UK is actually is positively really correlated with the load, with the demand. So when uh, during the peak hours, actually with the wind generates more, this is different from uh, before, uh, you know, uh, from other, uh, some of the other areas, regions. Before I came to the, uh, to the D, I worked in the, in the States, modeled the electricity system in Texas. Texas, you know, during the very, 
uh, peak hours is in the summer afternoon, there is no wind. The UK is uh, when we have uh, you know, higher demand, we have wind, that's good. So uh, the, what other factors we look at it? We look at obviously the demand change uh, and then the gas price because the gas price has uh, increased, has increased by about 45% between 2009 and 2018. Coal price has also increased uh, by about uh, 25%. Carbon price, uh, carbon price, as you know, uh, in the UK was part of the EU ETS, now has the UK has its uh, own uh, emission trading system, so you need to pay a carbon price. Also, there is a carbon supporting uh, scheme, a carbon price supporting scheme called a CPIs. So that's add on to this carbon price. So the carbon price at the end between 2018 and 2009 has also more than doubled. Uh, so we look at all these different factors and how these factors are contribute to this electricity price. Uh, so uh, this is one of the key result slides. Uh, so this is all across hours. You can see the wind as the one as the wind. Uh, yeah, so the uh, per gigawatt hour of daily wind. So uh, as one gigawatt hour of wind uh, increase uh, of wind, it will re reduce the electricity price. So this is just for one gigawatt hour. Now, uh, the next slide I will show you more uh, measurable, you know, uh, what has been done. So the important thing here is you can see uh, almost every half hour the electricity price has been reduced associated with the one gigawatt hour of electricity increase. Uh, so this is a look at how uh, how has it been done uh, for the electricity price, our wholesale electricity price uh, between 2009 and 2018. So this over a 10 year period. So as I said, a lot of changes. Uh, so this we look at, you know, uh, how each of these changes will do on our wholesale electricity price. So when has reduced electricity price. Uh, so uh, I look at this across the time period, it's reduced price by about three, three pounds and uh, 50, 35 cents a pence. And then uh, the, where is this? Uh, yeah, the other one is the load, the load reduction has reduced the price uh, quite uh, significantly. Uh, then obviously the, Price, the natural gas price, this one is natural gas price, has increased and has, in, has a more positive impact increase price, electricity price. And then the, this one, CPF, is essentially is the uh, carbon price, uh, carbon price flow code, is the, essentially the carbon price. So uh, the in a nutshell, basically, so this uh, gas price. And the carbon price increased, both of the price has increased because carbon price has increased more than double, and the gas price has increased by 45%, has increased the uh, wholesale electricity price by almost 15 pounds uh, per megawatt hour. Uh, load and the, uh, uh, the expansion of wind has reduced the electricity price. And so that's why at the end we see the also, electricity price has been increased. Uh, this is the contribution to the carbon emissions. Uh, so obviously we are in the process to drive into net zero. Uh, so when has contributed to the electricity, the carbon emission reduction uh, over this 10 years period. Uh, so I look at this, it's contributed to about 25 million tons of carbon emission reduction. So the whole UK over this 10 years period, uh, be, uh, so from the carbon emission from electricity generation has reduced by 85 million tons per year. Uh, so the expansion of wind has contributed to 24, 25 uh, million tons. Uh, load reduction has a 41% reduction. Uh, and uh, okay, so, and the, yeah, so the other thing is, so when load, uh, 
the uh, carbon price, carbon price has, imp has an important effect uh, or negative effect as well. So it will reduce the uh, carbon emissions by 14 million tons. Now gas price, because gas price, in, uh, when gas price is incre in increased, it makes coal relatively cheaper. So the gas price increase actually has a, uh, a positive impact on the carbon emissions. Uh, the, that's, uh, the, other thing is about the system cost. The system cost, what is the system cost? System cost is the cost that the, the electricity system operator used to pay the uh, generators to whether to reduce some of the emission uh, the, or the uh, generation or uh, for some other generators they need to stand by uh, so provide the so-called ancillary service so uh, one of these big uh, cost factor is this called constraint constraint is the uh, system operator pay for the wind generators to cut down their uh, generations. So there is a positive relation, correlation, and when we also uh, estimated how this uh, these different uh, all these different types of cost uh, affect uh, is associated with the one megawatt hour or uh, water hour or uh, wind generation. So the total cost is uh, one pounds, uh, 1.14 pence associated with one uh, terawatt hour generation. So uh, in uh, I also look at uh, between 2009 and 2018. So the actually this total system cost has increased by uh, about five pounds. Uh, so associated with the wind expansion. So that's all uh, I have. I see one last minute is my conclusion. So basically is uh, so the wind generation has significantly lowered the electricity uh, price uh, in almost every hour. And then the load reduction and increased wind uh, are the two most important factors uh, to reduce lowering the price, gas and carbon price increase the price. And then this load reduction, carbon price and wind all contribute to the CO2 emissions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Well, Sean, anybody that thinks economics is the dismal science after that, but a visible performance just is completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> and anybody who thinks that uh, uh, energy economics is simple, you know now it's not. This is a very <laughs> complex uh, uh, multifactorial uh, set of issues. But um, uh, thank goodness that one of the assets we do have off these islands is wind. Sometimes too much. <laughs> but, uh, uh, hopefully that will continue to see wind energy contribute to uh, uh, price moderation, but also to uh, a sustainability. And it's fantastic the work that you do in CEPMLP does around uh, helping us uh, create that transition to what Graham talked about earlier this morning, that transition to net zero and that transition to sustainability. So three uh, quite different, but, but uh, certainly inspiring and, and very in, uh, interactive and a kind of multidisciplinary approach uh, presentations this afternoon. Perhaps colleagues, it's time for you to, well, we've got you know, a shade under 15 minutes to uh, uh, ask questions, and I'm sure there are plenty of questions uh, uh, piling up for you. So it's hot seat time. Have enjoyment in front of the stage. So just to remind you, uh, uh, David spoke to us about uh, enterprise and economic transformation. Liz talked to us about uh, uh, protein secretion and uh, uh, the impacts of, of uh, uh, influencing protein secretion disease outcomes. And Sean talked to us about energy and transitions and particularly the, ro the role of um, wind power in, well, both creating that with sustainability and also keeping some of the prices down, although it might not feel it when they get the energy bill coming uh, through the door. So, in the room or beyond the room? Who'd like to start with some questions? Well done. So there's one here and one there. One, two, three. 
Hi, I've got a question for David. Um, you focus in your talk very much on Dundee um, and the economic impact on the city. How about wider economic impact of your role and the focus across Scotland and the UK? I mean, in particular, in relation to what companies do we work with and what opportunities do we look for? Thanks. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, that company uh, income typically for research or for research and development type activity, but it may be for other activities. I think that is within the scope of the role, um, but I think that we're probably looking at, you know, I know conceptually we're not going to transform the economy of anywhere else on the basis of what we're doing here. So because of the transformation word, I concentrated locally. We, I think the research that the university does, lots of the research that the university does, has the potential to be commercialised successfully all across the place, but it's, but it's transformation of our city that's my preoccupation, I think. Thanks, David. Thanks, Daniela. Next one. Hi, uh, thank you all three very much. My question's for Liz, and it might seem a stupid one. Uh, and it's based on. Be my careful, he's a paleogeographer. Yeah, so <laughs> my, my limited knowledge of the uh, cell structure and proteins, which mostly was derived from watching the news during the pandemic. But I was wondering how much of what you were describing is visible under high end microscopy how much of it is inferred by looking at chemical changes so in a practical level it's almost all inferred we have lots of different ways of detecting that material that's secreted and that's the easiest way to do it so we can use um, antibodies that specifically recognize individual proteins that's how we do that pulse chase experiment to pull on and identify an individual protein the other thing that we do in the lab is to use mass spectrometry, which is a method that identifies all of the proteins in any given sample. And so what we would do, for instance, is in our cell culture, where we're growing these cells in a, in a test tube, is spin out the cells by centrifugation, they're heavy, and take the proteins from the cells and the proteins that are secreted, and then put them through the mass spectrometer, and that will tell us all of the proteins so that we can identify and quantify all of the proteins that way. Proteins themselves are visible in the electron microscope, um, but we can't yet determine exactly their structure or their abundance with that method. But the, the technology is, is moving forward and that's the goal in fact, is to be able to visualize individual proteins. So it's so a little bit of artist's impression in, in, Absolutely. in up there, which of course many of our colleagues in DG CAD uh, are leading on uh, as well. But what a fantastic heuristic it is for us to think through um, uh, 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 the mechanisms and, and the interactions. And thank you for these uh, wonderful pictures. We appreciate them. Next one up there. Hi, my question is also to Liz. So my question is, uh, based on your research, do you have a recommendation for daily protein intake or minimal level of protein intake? Um, so no, because it's, it's, that's sort of a nutrition problem of, of where, where your cells are getting their building blocks from. And so the reason we need to eat dietary protein is to make sure that that, that then gets broken down into these amino acids. And those are the building blocks to make up our own proteins. And so that's why we need to ingest protein is so to fuel our own protein synthesis within our bodies. So you need protein, um, but equally we break down our own proteins and there's a lot of turnover within our bodies. And so you, 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 our bodies do both things. So you need a certain amount of protein. It doesn't necessarily matter the source. A protein is a protein from your body's point of view. Um, there may be differences talking about synthetic proteins, synthetic meats and things like that. That's a whole different question. But from your body's point of view, a dietary protein is dietary protein and it, your body needs it to make those building blocks so it can then build up its own proteins. Does that answer your question? So, sounds like a bit of a conversation of a coffee. Of that Absolutely. Well. Sure <laughs> I've got two more questions that are lined up in, in, in the room and then we'll go online. But I might... A uh, question for Sean. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, the economics of energy storage are critical as we transition to net zero. Would you like to ju just add some commentary on that uh, about what we should be doing as a nation in terms of uh, of energy storage? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's uh, the storage. Uh, 
there are two things. One is obviously it is important. There is a long duration and short duration to the storage. The longer duration is particularly those like the pump storage. So obviously it depends on the uh, geography, right? So you have to have a reservoir. Then the more uh, importantly for the electricity balancing purpose is probably is the, is the uh, battery system. So it's a few hours. So it's still people talk about, you know, eight hours as a long duration. Duration. The problem there is the cost is uh, still ex ex expensive, but this is definitely something that uh, uh, actually I may uh, actually engage on this. So, you know, we are uh, how a student look at this, and they so well, yeah. So that's uh, uh, if we really we, in this uh, particularly with a large amount of renewables. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you, Sean. Next one. Um, I have a question for Professor Miller. Um, I'm a clinician and so I, I'm excited about seeing your research. I wondered how, how far along you are in your research or, or how early on you are, because I saw you had AstraZeneca was one of your um, contributors um, to getting a working or some working hypothesis for them to start moving towards clinical trials or a, kind of some idea of how you could transfer that into clinical practice. Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you. So the, the collaboration with AstraZeneca it was through um, a collaborative grant process through the LMB, which is my previous home, that was really, it's called Blue Skies Research, and it really was basic discovery to marry interests of the two institutions. And AstraZeneca has a long-term interest in PCSK9 specifically, and they helped us to develop these assays. In fact, Weirdly, they didn't want to support the drug discovery aspect of that because they didn't want to get into small molecule discovery. And so that's what we're doing here with the drug discovery unit. So and, and so what I would say is that this one small molecule we have, this 4PBA, is a pretty crappy drug. We have to use very high concentrations that has knock-on effects. What we really want to do is, is that's the handle, that's sort of the chink in the armor, and that with the drug discovery unit, we can have structural biology approaches. We have to sort of get into some jargon, we have crystal structures of some of these proteins. And so we know exactly the molecular details of some of those interactions with machine learning and computational approaches. I'm hoping we can computationally design better small molecules. And we have this assay now that the Drug Discovery Unit, the National Phenotypic Screening Centers here in Dundee will help us do drug screens that I am hopeful will really be the next step. So we're at still at very early stages, but I think there's enormous potential. And the fact that we have one small molecule in hand and the proof of principle is actually the key advance. But our focus on small molecules creates our opportunity, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. OK, so I've got a question, Sean, from, for, for you, from somebody uh, uh, online. Uh, and it's two questions. One is, how can constraint costs be reduced in, in uh, uh, future generation? And secondly, Kind of picks up a little bit on uh, uh, what Mike Ferguson was asking before. Um, uh, as well as generation infrastructure, do you think we need more transmission infrastructure between uh, uh, Scotland and England, where where net generation and net load is really quite differently uh, uh, distributed across uh, uh, the country? Yeah, uh, um, I think you're on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so these two questions actually are related the constraint cost is also about the the transmission so uh, as we have more wind generation there is a definitely demand for more transmission transmission lines if we more transmission lines this country's constraint cost you use to pay the generator to reduce their generation will be can be reduced. Uh, obviously, there is a cost of building this transmission. So that's uh, uh, it, it's the same thing, actually. Yeah. So I think this uh, the second question is also the, the same. Uh, so actually, uh, yeah, uh, I, I had, you know, I present this uh, thing in September in Oxford. In, so afterwards, there are, is a company approaching to us to see what we can do to do the, some of this, to like particularly this curtailed wind, or what can we do to make it more, you know, for available for uh, social house, social homes. Yeah. Great, thank you. So I've got, uh, I'm going to use chairman's privilege because we've only got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to ask the last question. David, it's coming at you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we are doing, you're doing uh, all this great work around enterprise and economic transformation here in Dundee. 
How, how do we link what we are doing here best in Dundee to the future of the Scottish economy as well as the, the uh, Dundee economy? How do you move away from having uh, Glasgow doing a Glasgow thing, Edinburgh doing the Edinburgh thing, Dundee doing the Dundee thing, Aberdeen doing the Aberdeen thing, and have more of an ecosystem of uh, a future economic transformation within the areas that you're involved in? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's been an awful lot of strategies been published by public agencies over the last few years. Some have been good, some have been not so good. Uh, I think the Scottish, Scottish government's innovation strategy that was published in May 2023 is one of the better documents that's come out about this kind of space, because I think it's the first time that there's been an explicit recognition by Scottish government in particular that uh, it's not this idea of the only place in Scotland for life sciences is Edinburgh Bioquarter. You know, they've recognised, I think, that they can go for a cluster based approach where the cluster could be distributed throughout the country. And I think that if we can hang on to what was in that strategy, I think it would be in our university's benefit and I think it would be in Scotland's benefit. Um, the problem, of course, as we've touched on lots of people today, including at the court session, touched on the fact that the Scottish government isn't awash with cash at the moment to make these kind of strategies become more real. But I think in terms of the pointers that have been made, that, that Scottish innovation strategy to me perhaps is the, is the most encouraging one um, because, it, because it is... Uh, approaching a whole Scotland approach. And I think we can be a good citizen in that by reaching out to the other universities that we already partner with. And, and I think that's probably our best chance of benefiting from, from, from that approach. So Scotland is a cluster and us trying to take the lead in making it a reality. Right? Yeah, making making the connections happen, I think, is an area where, because there's been investment before in things that are supposed to connect the sector, but the investment tends to be in the place that's already currently the biggest beneficiary and they don't always use it to reach out to the others. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that's uh, run out of time for this session. Uh, coffee is available, uh, I'm sure tea as well, outside. Uh, but please join me in once again thanking your first three, first three speakers, Sean, Liz and David. For that <laughs>